I am Shay Dawson, and I am a pre-doctoral fellow in Gender Studies with the National Women's History Museum. For nearly three decades, the National Women's History Museum has served as an innovative online museum dedicated to uncovering, interpreting, and celebrating women's diverse contributions to society. As the nation's leading cultural institution for women's history, the museum's pioneering research, innovative and accessible programming, and resources for educators and learners of all ages ensures women's history is available to all. Beginning next month, we'll embark on an exciting next chapter, bringing women's history in person to communities across the country, starting with our new partnership with the DC Public Library. On March 30th, we'll debut We Who Believe in Freedom, Black Feminist DC, our first physical exhibition in our new home for exhibits and programming, the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. I am joined today by Dr. Sheetal Desai and Dr. Ainsley McLean, both practicing physicians and leaders with the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. We are very excited to be here today to recognize National Women Physician Day, celebrating the birthday of the first female doctor in the United States, Elizabeth Blackwell. Today, we honor women doctors across the country and reflect on the progress they've made since Blackwell's time. I'd now like to introduce our panelists joining this conversation, uh, Dr. Desai and Dr. McLean. Hi, good afternoon, Shay, and thank you for such a warm welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm Sheetal Desai. I'm a family medicine physician by clinical background, and I'm a practicing physician at Kaiser Permanente of the Mid-Atlantic States with the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Medical Group. I've been with our organization for about 14 years now, and I currently serve as the physician in chief for the District of Columbia and Suburban Maryland service area. What that means is that I help oversee our 700 physicians across 40 different specialties who are providing medical care to just over 385,000 patients. And it's an honor to be here today. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, oh. Sheetal. And thank you, Shay, so much for having me. And thank you so much to Kaiser Permanente and the National Women's History Museum for putting on this important event. I think events like this are just what today is really all about. So I'm Ainsley McLean. I'm a radiologist by training, a neuroradiologist, so a medical doctor who specializes in interpreting imaging of the brain and spine. I'm also chief medical information officer and associate medical director for radiology at Kaiser Permanente here in the Washington DC area. I trained previously at Harvard Brigham and Women's Hospital for my radiology training, and I've been with Kaiser Permanente for 10 years. So thank you once again for having me. Absolutely, thank you both so much. So everyone viewing, we are looking forward to your questions. So if you're watching live, please feel free to post them in the comments on Facebook. So we're really excited to start this conversation honoring Elizabeth Blackwell, who in 1849 became the first women, woman in the United States to be granted an MD degree. Blackwell began her pioneering journey after a deathly ill friend insisted that she would have received better care from a female doctor. Blackwell faced many obstacles on her path to her degree and even after she officially began practicing in hospitals. So some of these obstacles were her constantly being rejected to even attend school due to her gender. And once she was accepted, her professors often forced her to sit separately from the males in her classroom and often excluded her from labs. So at a certain point, she went abroad to study, I believe in London and Paris, but due to gender norms, she was often relegated to nursing or even midwifery. She did eventually come back to New York uh, where she had very few patients due to being a woman. Um, even so, she did eventually have her own small clinic and at another point she started her own medical college. Um, so she also wrote an autobiography in 1895 called Pioneer Work in Opening the Medical Profession to Women. So this title is extremely fitting because she truly was a pioneer and a trailblazer. So to kick off some questions here, uh, Dr. McLean, who are some other women physician trailblazers that come to mind for you that have inspired you? And how do you personally feel that their contributions have paved the way for women physicians like yourself today? What a great question, Shay. And I think Dr. Blackwell ends up sort of being um, the face of, of today, but there are really so many women throughout history whose stories are maybe not as well told. Um, a few that come to mind are Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumbler. She was the first African-American woman to earn an MD in the United States. 
Dr. Joyce Lynn Elder was our first African-American Surgeon General. Um, Dr. Mary Putnam Jacoby, I, I love her story. Um, she debunked some of the myths that were um, prevalent at the time around women who had menstruation. Um, so a Harvard professor wrote a piece about how during the period of menstruation, um, women should refrain from studying or any activity. And you can only imagine what an impact that would have on women's education if that were truly the case. And um, she wrote a, a really thorough, thoughtful article um, contradicting this theory uh, and won an award for that as well. Um, Dr. Ann Preston was a first woman dean of a medical school. Um, Dr. Susan Picotti was the first Native American woman to earn a medical degree. And um, Dr. Virginia Apwar, I'll just share her story. It's one of my favorite. Um, some of you may know that when a new baby is born, um, there's something um, that we all learn in medical school called the Apgar score. Um, and so this was very important because when babies are born, previously, uh, prior to her work, there was really no objective way for pediatricians and the doctors in the labor and delivery room to quantify the health of a newborn baby. And so the APGAR score developed um, by Dr. APGAR really was critical in allowing us to identify babies who may need more serious um, help in those first few minutes of life. Um, so I could go on and on, um, but those are just a few. And, and I think one of the things that I'd encourage um, anyone who's watching today to think about is to really take a little bit of a deeper dive into any of those women's stories. I think um, the last thing I'll say, Shay, just to piggyback off your comment about Dr. Blackwell, a common theme for all of these women is that numerous obstacles stood in their way. And um, they always pivoted and they looked for a way to follow their dreams and they never gave up. And oftentimes it was that very obstacle that led them to that next path in their career. Something I always try to remember. Yeah, absolutely. That's some, some really great insights. And I love that each of the women that you brought up come from very different backgrounds. But then at the same time, there's still this similar through line of pursuing their passions and overcoming these obstacles, like you mentioned. Um, so I think that's really amazing. Thank you for such a thorough answer. Um, so we'll kick off another question for you, Dr. Desai. Um, you know, we've been talking a little bit about overcoming obstacles and various challenges. And, you know, while this is a day to celebrate female positions, I think it also sheds light on the challenges that female positions have faced both historically and presently. Um, so I would love to hear your thoughts on what some of those challenges are today and how you personally feel that we can overcome them. Yeah, absolutely, Shay. Great question. And so, you know, we we learned a little bit from Dr. McLean about some of the first women who entered medicine and, and their accomplishments. Um, when you look at the percentage of women physicians uh, in the United States, I think we reached a pivotal point in 2019, where for the first time, uh, more than 50% of medical students in the country uh, identified as, as women. And so now just over 50% of uh, medical students in the country are, are women. And when you look at the physician workforce currently for physicians across the country, just over 36% um, of physicians in the workforce across the country are women. And so that number has been steadily increasing year over year, which is fantastic to yeah. see. Um, but of course, there are still challenges and we hear about these challenges uh, uh, with stories across the country related to gender bias in terms of entering certain specialties and being considered for certain promotions. We hear about salary inequity we do hear about um, lack of recognition and professional harassment. And I think that the, some of the important things that we can do to counter some of this is first of all, events like this, um, really recognizing uh, the contribution of women in medicine and shedding light on these issues, uh, looking towards organizations such as the organization that, that Ainsley and I work for, um, where there really is a focus on equity, inclusion, and diversity, and issues like this are being addressed and, and solutions being given. Um, as a women physician, I think the part that we individually play is uh, really thinking about what you want in your career and not being afraid to ask for it. And if you're not seeing an immediate solution, uh, asking for solutions and really, really reaching out to colleagues, um, calling out inequity when you see it uh, in, a, in a constructive manner and looking for viable solutions. So I think th those are some of the things that all of us as women physicians and allies of women physicians can really bring to light in the workplace. Uh, 
to, to start countering some of these challenges that we're seeing. Absolutely. That's such a great response. And I love your comment about how events like this uh, really get at the heart of, you know, how can we overcome these challenges? And I think, too, what your answer gets at is that talking and being open about our experiences and the things that we're seeing, I think, is definitely a huge part of how we can overcome these challenges. Essentially, too, I think working together, uh, collaborations, communication, 100%, um, definitely in this field, but I think just across the board for women. Um, so both of your answers have been wonderful so far, and it's getting me a little curious about your personal journeys to medicine. Um, you know, we've talked about challenges, but I would love to know, you know, how you grew up, maybe if there's other doctors in your family that have inspired you, what essentially made you officially become uh, dedicated to this path, and how you decided your specialties as well. And either of you can start. <laughs> Go ahead, Ainsley. <laughs> Thanks, Chutel. Um, I love what you said, Chutel, and I think the other thing I'll just um, add to that, too, is when you're looking at organizations, look at those that have really established women leadership programs, and I'm really proud of, at Kaiser Permanente, the developed programs we have around women leadership, um, and, and I think personally have really benefited from that. So my story, so I'm a third-generation physician. Um, I'm really proud of that. My mom actually is a pioneer in her own right. She was one of the first adolescent pediatricians. And what do I mean by that? So before, before adolescent pediatricians, we used to think that teenagers were either little adults or big kids. For any of you who have teenagers or no teenagers, I think we know that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, she was one of a few women in her medical school. Um, and, and I went to medical school knowing that I wanted to be a doctor, but I actually had a little bit of an interesting course. I majored in art as an undergraduate with a focus in photography and actually did my senior thesis around a women's oncology or cancer ward and um, combining art students um, with volunteer service on that cancer ward. And for that, we took pictures of the women's hands. And what struck me about um, this group of women is they occupied one floor of a hospital that was dedicated to childbirth. And so in this same building in which you have such an incredibly happy um, experience for women, which childbirth can be, you have these women who are experiencing a really challenging portion in their own lives, dealing with gynecologic cancers or, or cancers involving the gyneco gynecologic tract of women. Um, and so from there, I led, um, I really found my way towards radiology. Um, and that might seem a little bit of an odd path, but radiology is really the study of anatomy and understanding anatomy. And so it was my love and respect for the human body that I developed through my study of art mm -hmm. that then led me to this very visual profession within medicine. Um, I'm also a big believer and, and lover of uh, technology, as you can tell from my uh, role as chief medical information officer. And radiology tends to be very technologically based, whether it's doing a mammogram or an MRI or other advanced imaging. Along the lines of specialties, which you mentioned, Sheetal, I can remember many times um, during my medical career in which I mentioned I was going into radiology that I would sort of get this funny look. Um, you know, why are you going into radiology? You're so personable. Why don't you go into um, something else like pediatrics or OBGYN? Um, and, and, and I think that it's, it was a compliment in some ways, but in other ways, um, it's something that we've seen recurrent within my profession of radiology. And, and as societies, um, we've studied why is that? Why are women um, really not um, making up the majority by any means in radiology. Um, it actually stands out compared to many other specialties as not having a lot of women. Um, and it may be um, the thoughts are around just technology, but also that for whatever reason, women are directed away from it. I'm really proud uh, that at Kaiser Permanente, um, our Permanente radiologists, um, we have 50% women um, within our department and, and really leading the way. Um, we have a huge focus on women's health at Kaiser Permanente. Within radiology, although I'm a neuroradiologist, one of my passions is women's breast imaging. We're a nation leader in breast cancer screening. We perform 500 screening mammograms a day, and we read 95% of those within one hour. So we have many busy, busy women who come in and have a screening mammogram. And for any of you who've had a mammogram, you know that even though it's just a routine screening exam, you start thinking about 
what's going to happen to me if, if I'm diagnosed with breast cancer? What does that mean for my kids? What does that mean for me, the people I love? And so we pride ourselves in getting those results to women quickly. The vast majority of screening mammograms are totally normal. We don't think women should have to worry for more than one second. So our patients at Kaiser Permanente often tell me the story. They're walking to the parking lot. Their phone dings. They get a little <laughs> reminder that, you know, the mammogram they just had 15 minutes ago is normal. And uh, nothing makes our radiologists happier uh, than to know that our women can go about leading their lives um, and really knowing that everything is fine. On the flip side, um, if for some reason our patients are diagnosed with breast cancer, we have an incredible team of specialists from oncologists to pathologists to radiation oncologists who step right in and help provide that care. We know women make the majority of healthcare decisions um, for their families. And um, we need to take care of you, most importantly for you, but also for everyone who depends on you. So um, I, I, I think I've taken a, a lot of different paths, Shay, to get to where I am today. Um, and one of the most important things I do really is continuing to mentor. Um, you know, every week I get an email from a medical student or a resident saying, you know, Dr. McLean, um, what can I do to kind of um, lay the groundwork to be someone like you or to be in a role where I have more of a voice and um, having that ability to talk to those women and hear their stories is definitely what makes me get up every day. So thank you. Thank you. That's amazing. I am so intrigued by, you know, I feel like a lot of the times there's this discourse that, you know, arts and sciences are separate, which is fascinating because your story, I think, is a great example that they really are not. There are a lot of really similar through lines. And I think just an amazing narrative overall, but I think that's the number one thing that I kind of picked out there that I think is really interesting. Um, so yeah, the floor is yours, Dr. Desai. I would love to hear your story as well. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. And um, so I was actually born uh, and raised in England, which is actually where Elizabeth Blackwell is from. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I'm a first generation physician in my family. And so uh, we came over to the United States after I had completed high school. And so my higher education was here in the United States with uh, undergraduate and uh, medical school at the University of Maryland, uh, followed my, by my family medicine residency at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in Philadelphia. And so, you know, as a first generation physician and first generation woman physician, um, uh, back in England, we had a family friend who uh, she was a budding nephrologist at the time and is uh, actually just recently retired. I followed her career uh, even after moving here to the United States, who was an early role model for me and really the only role model that I had seen back in England in terms of a, a woman physician. So very impactful uh, as I stay in touch with her even now, uh, many years later. Uh, in terms of why family medicine, uh, what I really loved is the ability for the continu continuity of care and the ability mm -hmm. to take care of multiple uh, generations. That, that was what really appealed to me. And as Ainsley mentioned, you know, oftentimes in many households, uh, the women do drive decisions around healthcare uh, and, and drive a lot of the, the care in the family. And I found that to be really impactful and, and that influenced my decision as well. Um, I do want to mention that that's been cultivated really heavily at Kaiser Permanente. Ainsley mentioned the fantastic work that she leads in radiology around breast cancer screening. Um, we also have a really robust cardiology program. And uh, I wanna mention that today is actually National uh, Women's Heart Health Day, the first Friday in February, where we encourage everyone to wear red uh, in recognition of this day, yes, as we both are, um, and to, to really raise awareness of heart disease in women. Um, it is still the number one killer of women. One in three women uh, will experience heart disease at some point in their lifetime. And so this is all also a call to action for all of us women to make sure that we're taking care of ourselves and that you know your numbers, you know what your blood pressure is, you know what your sugar is and your cholesterol, um, that you know what your body mass index is, which is a, a ratio of your weight to uh, height, um, that you're trying to control risk factors such as smoking, um, exercising, good nutrition, and that you know your family history of heart disease as well. Um, Self-care is incredibly important and it's something that we uh, emphasize here and, and we wanna ensure that women are taking care of themselves. Um, and so the, the path to Kaiser Permanente 
And what's kept me here is that just the incredible support of women's health, not only through cardiology and screening programs, um, we have a really robust gynecology program here, including GYN oncology, urogynecology, prenatal program, the focus on maternal health. Um, uh, the, the organization, I think, does a really, really good job uh, in terms of uh, leading the nation in terms of the women's health that we provide. That's amazing. I Wonderful story as well. And I think through both of your narratives, I'm hearing a really great through line that you also feel very supported by the practice that you work for. And I think that can 100% make a difference. Um, and I'm so glad to hear that you're both feeling so supported in that way, because as a comment from Facebook says, you're both very inspiring women. And so I think your narratives are just really wonderful. And thank you for sharing those with us. Um, I actually have a question for you both from Facebook, um, kind of going back to where we were talking about different obstacles and different backgrounds. Um, so the question here reads, I rarely see black or native female doctors in my 66 years. I imagine the barriers are still in place. Um, I'm going to assume in terms of um, being a minority woman in the field. Um, so if either of you would like to take on that question or share your perspective. Um, I can I can take that first, Sheetal, and then I'll, I, I know you're definitely um, can chime in on this. Sure. So I, I think one thing I would say is come to Kaiser Permanente. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have so many incredible um, African-American physicians and leaders um, within our practice. And that's something that we're all very, very proud of. But as you allude to, um, there are certainly barriers. There's a wonderful book that just came out um, called Twice as Hard um, mm -hmm. by Jasmine Brown. Yeah. And actually, you know, she tells, she's a, a medical student at UPenn where you trained. Mm -hmm. And it talks about the struggles of black medical students um, within their training um, that they are still encountering. And I think that we have to continue to raise awareness of that um, as well as, as you mentioned, Native American women. I mentioned um, a pioneering Native American uh, physician. And in a lot of these women, um, just like Dr. Blackwell, arose from a, a really demand from women for female physicians. So Dr. Blackwell's friend that you mentioned, Shay, had uterine cancer. And she said, you know, I would love if I could have a woman physician taking care of me. Um, likewise, the pioneering Native American women physicians arose really around a need for women to take care of women Native Americans. And so when we as women ask for women doctors and we seek out women doctors, and I'm thinking of my own pediatrician and my own GYN, um, you know, that's really how we help to support, um, to support developing and future doctors, but also just as being role models and taking that time. Um, I don't take it for granted uh, that we are in a medical group that really supports that. I do interact with uh, radiologists from around the country. Um, and it's actually very um, uncommon to have mm -hmm. a woman leader of radiology in most practices across this country. So I think that we live in um, a little bit of a very positive um, bubble is the wrong word, but um, a little bit of a deviation from the norm still. So I think that question is spot on. Um, and we have to, there's a lot of work that we still have to do. Yep. So thanks. And Chief, I'll turn over to you. Yeah, I think that that's, uh, again, another area where I think Kaiser Permanente has really led the charge, where here in the mid-Atlantic states, 25% um, of our physicians are uh, uh, African-American, uh, about 30% are identified as Asian, another 30% as Caucasian. And I think the physician workforce here really reflects the diversity of the patient population that we take care of and serve. And I think that's important. It's important for patients to be able to identify or find someone that they identify with to provide their care for them. We're, we're also very intentional about um, displaying that demographic information when you look up any of our physician uh, web pages so that patients really feel that they can find the, the type of physician that they would like to within our practice, that there's choice of physicians. Um, I think the medical group has also done a really great job in terms of um, hiring and, and promoting women. So I mentioned that across the country, about 37% of physicians are women. Um, here at Kaiser Permanente, 61% are women. So we're majority women physicians at this point. 
Um, and in terms of leadership, uh, a similar percentage, 60% of our leaders, uh, physician leaders are women here in the organization. So uh, truly walking the walk here. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, I'm very fascinated by how knowledgeable you both are. I think it both in terms of your respective um, focuses, but I think also in terms of issues in the field in general. And so I can see you both being really great mentors to the new generation that are coming into these fields. And I would be curious about your thoughts on how you inspire generations coming into this field, because I feel like this conversation has been a pretty good mix of here are the challenges, but here are also the really great things about being in this field. So, you know, how do you confront those things or those topics with those who might express interest um, in, in either working in the same uh, specialties that you are both in or just general interest in the field. And that can be for either of you, both of you. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can never start too young in terms of, uh, you know, mentoring and uh, creating interest in the next generation of women physicians from grade school onwards. Um, I know both of us and many of our women physicians participate in opportunities in our community uh, to get the word out there in terms of what we do and the opportunities available to you. And we actually have um, a mentorship program uh, and a shadowing program where students can come and spend time with our physicians and see what we're doing on a daily basis. And I think that's the key is is really being available uh, as role models and uh, and having opportunities for for uh, students and children and other women to see you know what we do. Yeah, and, and one of the things I'll just chime in that I, I frequently give as advice to women who want to pursue medicine is to just really say yes to opportunities that come your way, and I would say that, that to you know, a fifth grade girl who came to me and said, what is the best thing I can do? I think it's when you're given an opportunity to seize it. And we see time and time again, um, and you know, the studies show this, that women are less likely to accept promotions. They're less likely to kind of reach for that next step. And um, the doors will open for you the more you take on. And, um, and I don't mean to the extent of not achieving balance in your life. Everyone needs balance. Um, but oftentimes the opportunities that you are presented with will just give you the, so many more that you could never foresee. So to close that door um, without giving it a chance, um, you know, at the end of the day, it isn't the way um, you really want things to go. So just say yes. That's kind of that's kind of the motto I live by. Yeah, that's amazing. I feel like I'm not a doctor, not studying to be a doctor, but I feel like even both of your insights are something I'm going to carry forward with me. And I hope too that our viewers take forward with us as or with them as well. Um, just to read this quick comment to you all before we close out for today. Um, it's been shared that we are grateful every day for our female doctor. She listens and understands. Both of you are amazing. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. Both of you are wonderful. So thank you so much, Dr. McLean and Dr. Desai for such an insightful discussion today. And thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with your friends and colleagues. Uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Instagram. Thank you all so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Shay. Thank you, Shay. Thank you for everything you're doing. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Thank you.